Okay then, good morning. Um, welcome to the first in the series of our Essential Skills Insights, uh, very kindly sponsored and powered by Flowgas. I'm here with Paul Komiski, who's going to deliver our first session on critical thinking. Um, before I hand over to Paul, I'd like to just go through some housekeeping. Um, so I hope you can hear and see us. Um, find the Q&A function. This is the Q&A function that you're going to use for your interactions this morning. And the chat function, if you're having any difficulties with the uh, with any technical difficulties. Also, if you could rename your profile uh, name uh, so that during the Q&A, we can direct your questions uh, to Paul uh, from the, the correct name. And then there's going to be a 15 minute uh, uh, Q&A at the end of Paul's presentation. So we definitely recommend that you interact with us via the Q&A field so that we can get through as many questions as possible. And then at the end, you'll be redirected to a online survey, which we would really encourage you to take because uh, we really value your, um, your feedback. Okay, then, thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over now to Paul for this um, really interesting session on critical thinking. Thank you. Thanks, Elva. Uh, morning, folks. Um, so, hopefully everyone can see my, my screen here. Yes, we can see it, Paul. Yep. So, uh, as an introduction, I suppose, since uh, to critical thinking. So if you look back in uh, in Western philosophy to Plato, Aristotle, and uh, of course, Socrates, and then in Eastern philosophy, um, specifically uh, Confucius, critical thinking has um, been stu much studied, practiced in across disciplines of science, law, philosophy, engineering, and, and many others. So a journalism, obviously, as well. Um, in today's modern world, it's never been more needed, as we can see nowadays with what's happening, uh, underutilized and in many cases misrepresented and misunderstood. Um, <clears throat> so it's lack of a practical application, problems, you know, whether they be engineering problems or social problems or um, family problems or whatever, can take longer to resolve. Solutions are often implemented without adequate risk and cost benefit analysis. And the frameworks, uh, for example, for, uh, used for say problem solving, project management, knowledge management, et cetera, are very often poorly designed and applied. So this, this um, workshop here will map the critical thinking landscape showing the relevant inputs, processes and outputs that can be practiced or can be practically applied specifically in, in uh, you know, for our, our audience today in an engineering environment. So Confucius said, um, learning without thought is labor lost, taught without learning is perilous, and study without reflection is a waste of time, and reflection without study is dangerous. And then Francis Bacon, the very famous philosopher, critical thinking is a desire to seek, patience to doubt, fondness to meditate, slowness to assert, readiness to consider, carefulness to dispose and set an order, and hatred <clears throat> of every kind of um, imposture or imposition. Um, so our, our company, I, I, we have a small company, there's three of us, there's myself, um, we're all engineers, uh, although I'm a physicist, um, and we uh, work in providing technical and professional skills training and design services to the higher education sector and industry. Um, and we also provide engineering management services to specifically to the semiconductor industry. Currently, these are our customers here. I'm not going to read down through them, but you can see we, we would work with a number of the universities um, and then also some fairly big clients um, across um, in technical uh, disciplines. And uh, myself, I've spent um, 39 years working in, in initially in the military, marine, academic and industry organizations. I'm a qualified engineer and I still I still actually practice as an engineer. Um, and I'm also a, a qualified physicist and I've worked as a physicist. Um, I have a Lean Six Sigma black belt from um, CIT in Cork. So I've worked in a number of uh, areas or countries. Um, and I still work in China, uh, obviously not this year. Um, I teach in Nanjing University, which is quite a famous university in uh, central, the old capital of China. 
um, and my expertise then will be in physics, knowledge management, analytical problem solving, inventive thinking, uh, specifically TRIS systems and critical thinking. So what we're going to look at today is um, critical thinking overview. So why is it important in our, in our daily lives, if you like? And then critical thinking and its application in problem solving. And um, we're going to look um, at some frameworks and then we might briefly just look at um, Eastern versus Western thinking uh, process. There is a, a workshop and Elba will talk to this at the end um, on the 25th of November. It's a full day's workshop and then we will um, cover the, these topics in more depth, obviously, and then some additional topics. Um, as you can see here, I'm not, again, I won't read down through them all, but this will be the, the full day's workshop. We'll probably spend quite a bit of time on the problem solving stuff. Um, I think probably a good bit of time on Socratic questioning um, and probably um, some time here on um, the learning organization. So on critical thinking. So as we all know, our lives are made up of a series of decisions, uh, mostly small decisions, thankfully, but some are larger, okay? So whom we choose as our friends, what we choose to work at or what career we uh, pursue um, would tend to be big decisions. You know, who we marry, obviously, um, you know, if we're, if we're buying a house um, with a partner or something like that, or even on our own, that would be a big decision. But the smaller decisions like what we're going to eat this evening um, are also, um, you know, important decisions, but they don't take much of our um, cognitive load when we're making those decisions. Our decisions typically are based on assumptions. Um, for example, we assume our friends will always be trustworthy. Um, we also assume our career choices will be fulfilling and, and you know, make us financially secure. And again, sometimes that's the case, sometimes it's not. So critical thinking involves doing the following, discovering these assumptions that guide our decisions, checking the accuracy of the assumptions um, by looking at the assumptions from different perspectives and, and viewpoints. And then based on having done one and two above, making informed decisions that are based on these research um, assumptions. So some good definitions. So Richard Paul, who unfortunately is not with us anymore, um, he set up an, an organization called criticalthinking.org. You can look it up on the internet. <clears throat> so American guy and um, would be uh, himself. I mean, if you look, if you kind of look in libraries of, for books on critical thinking, you'll see um, himself and his wife, Linda. I can't think of what her second name is now, but they would have written a lot of books on um, critical thinking. And then also Stephen, Stephen Brookfield, another American, who would have written a lot on, on critical thinking. So he he's suggested that critical thinking is thinking about your thinking while you're, you are thinking in order to make your thinking better. That's my favorite definition, actually. Uh, when, you when you look at it first, you kind of say, God, what a load of rubbish. But when you actually look at it and think about it, that's actually what you're doing when you're critically thinking. Um, Edward Glazer then, critical thinking encompasses cognitive skills that possess, um, that should be, that's a misprint there, that should be just possess, three characteristics, a positive attitude towards the thoughtful consideration of problems, knowledge of logic reasoning, um, and then the ability to apply the aforementioned, uh, um, both the attitudes and strategies. And then um, most recently then this, this guy here who I've, I've met, um, Christopher Dwyer, he's Irish. Um, he's probably the most, um, if you look up critical thinking on the internet from a research paper perspective, you'll probably see him referenced almost more than anyone else, which is uh, great. Um, he's from I, I, <coughs> he's from either Limerick or Galway, I can't remember. He would teach in a lot of the Ivy uh, League universities in, he teaches critical thinking obviously in Ireland, um, but also in the Ivy League universities in the United States. So for him, it's a metacognitive process. So meta in Greek is 
twice and cognitive is thinking. So it's like thinking twice. So it's a thinking twice process that consists of a number of skills. Um, for example, analysis, evaluation and inference that when used uh, appropriately increase the chances of producing a logical solution or a valid conclusion. So, sorry, it's, it, it's not natural. Humans are, are not naturally good critical thinkers. If we were, we'd be dead. Um, so evolution made us only as logical as we needed to be to survive. So, you know, our other senses, not necessarily a critical thinking sense, um, were much more important for us to survive. Um, we tend to be pattern seekers and we like stories. So we like something to tell us a story, you know, so whether we're going to a lecture like this or an engineering lecture or, you know, watching something on a, a program on television, we like to be told a story. We like things to make sense and, um, and we like familiar patterns. The biggest obstacle to critical thinking is our own belief preservation system. So our mind has tendencies to recognize patterns and prioritize, and, and we all know this, prioritizing belief over evidence. Um, we have a tendency to use evidence to preserve our opinions rather than guide them. So when, when we, I'm just checking the time here, that's, when we talk about critical thinking, right? So critical thinking isn't just the thinking process. It's also about the reading and the writing process, right? So for engineers, critical writing is a really um, important skill. So for, for us as engineers, it typically involves designing tests and experiments, which are set up to output data, which can then be clearly analyzed to draw um, objective conclusions. It also involves presenting reports, you know, and I, I know many of you on the bridge today will be you know, this will be a core part of your job, you know, writing up and, and presenting reports, you know, whether they be project reports, you know, cost benefit analysis, risk assessment, safety reports, etc., which are both de detailed and technical, um, but also easy to follow for the reader, right? Um, and very often in these reports, the summary conclusion, next steps and lesson learned um, are, are often the most important sections of these of these reports from a reading perspective and um, when we're reading you know whether it's a book or a report you know what we're doing critical reading skills will be laying bare the assumptions that are often hidden beneath the surface doing appraisals on, of the re reliability and validity of the text understanding what conclusions and explanations are offered assessing the clarity of the writing and evaluating the merits of the text so if we continue that thought process forward for, for engineers and managers, this may involve reviewing and assessing data with no conclusions, unclear conclusions, poor statistical analysis, conclusions that contradict the data, data based on poorly designed experiments, poorly validated models, where there is both supporting and contradicting evidence with no path to resolve. So, you know, I would spend part of my life as an engineer having to contend with this and i'm sure many of you on the bridge or if not all of you have to contend with this and this because this can be quite frustrating right so you know you're you're down then to making kind of a judgment okay so this stuff here doesn't make any sense that i'm reading okay is it because the person who's writ written it or the people who've written it don't know what they're doing or is it because they've poorly constructed the report and you know the study or the you know, the statistical analysis um, and the experiments, you know, and I'm not saying there is an answer to that, but, it, you know, certainly ask, it, it certainly surfaces those questions which you must must ask. Um, critical reading then also involves reading through quite technically demanding reports. And um, so some of these reports are very technical, they're very technically demanding and very tiring to read, okay, because you're you're focusing a lot of attention on them. Um, so because, you know, you as a senior engineer or an engineering manager may be required to make key decisions for, for your company based on, you know, the, what, you, what you're reading in these reports, um, whether it be, you know, be source inspections, beta tests, supplier calls, QAQC reports, etc. So um, and just carrying on from that, you know, when engineers are designing, DOE stands for design of experiments. So whether you're a, a mechanical engineer or a robotics engineer or a, 
um, construction engineer, design engineer, you know, you very often you have to design tests or experiments, you know, so critical skills associated with that will be, you know, dr presenting a strong, robust experiment or test design plan, understanding all the variables that are of concern to the model being tested, understanding the main effects and interactions, and clearly calling out differences between qualitative and quantitative results, identifying and planning the right sample size and replication, uh, writing up the experiment test to consider all possible variables, even if it means doing the design and stages, and then using a framework to test to, sorry, to design the test, which is both logical appropriate, and appropriate to the situation and easy for others to follow. And then when you're analyzing the results of the test, you know, you're reviewing the experiment or test plans, you're identifying weaknesses and strengths, you're understanding what type of statistics have been employed and if they've been correctly employed, you're understanding and interpreting the various um, graphs or plots, you know, probability plots, box plots, control charts, et cetera. You're identifying distributions. Are they Poisson? Are they bimodal? Are they normal? You're identifying hidden data within the plots, so populations within populations. Um, if you're doing hypothesis testing, um, you're understanding the degree of uncertainty and what the alternative hypothesis is. You're able to summarize data or experiment key points, and then you're able to inter interrogate conclusions objectively using statistical analysis and mathematics. Um, suggesting different, and then you're able to suggest different ways to rerun or cut the data. Now, this stuff is not easy. And, you know, I, I'm not saying all of us have to do this in our job. Um, but it's it's certainly a, a skill where you know someone would look at this and say, well, you just need a good statistician. I mean, you probably don't actually. You just need to maybe spend a bit more time learning statistics and then applying critical uh, thinking when you're analysing the data that um, you're present that the statistics is presenting. There's an interesting year in statistics and critical thinking. Um, it's it's 1954. So this was the, um, and I still haven't got my hands on this book, um, saw the publishing of How to Lie with Statistics, a very famous book, and still considered the best book written on statistics um, today. Um, so um, it, it was obviously an exercise in scorn. Um, and Tim Harford, the, the journalist, would say, if you read it, you, you may be disinclined to believe a number-based claim again. But it's interesting, in the same year, um, an alternative perspective was embodied in the publication of a paper on the effects of smoking on um, lung, you know, giving people lung cancer or increasing the, the chances of getting lung cancer. Um, and here the researchers did not use any statistical trickery and the data was so compelling that actually Americans, it was obviously in America initially, Americans actually started to give up smoking without any prompt from the governments. Um, you know, because the governments were very slow to uh, regulate the tobacco industry. Um, this program, I listened to it actually last week was its last its last week of the current series. So more or less is a very good program if you're interested in listening, listening to someone, uh, it's on the radio obviously, if you're in, interested in listening to someone uh, critically analyzing statistics, right? Um, and you can see that they were the times it was on. Um, and I, a number of this guy's books. He's he's quite a good writer. Um, he writes in the Financial Times magazine on on Saturdays. Um, and he, there earlier or last month, he had a, a fairly substantial article in the magazine around the five lessons he has based on his observations of um, statistics used during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Now they were predominantly British uh, government statistics. Um, but in summary, his observations were the numbers matter. Don't take the numbers for granted. Even the experts see what they expect to see. The best insights come with combining statistics with personal experience and everything can be polarized. So what he, he fleshed that out. Now I'm just summarizing what he had in his article. So he fleshed out the numbers matter. So it, from his perspective, without good data, um, you know, the British government would not have realized that the infection is 10,000 times more deadly for a 90 year old than for a nine year old, for example. It requires a statistical perspective to make it clear who is at risk and who is not. 
don't take the numbers for granted. And he used this, um, and I've seen this actually, this 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 uh, cautionary tale before. This this um, this is, uh, yeah, and some of you may have seen this before. So they call it Stamp's Law. So uh, Joshua Stamp, who who worked for the American government, um, said, no matter how how much a government may enjoy amassing statistics, he, and from his perspective, he says, raise them to the end power, take the cube root, and prepare wonderful diagrams. It is all too easy to forget that the underlying numbers would all, always all, all, all always come from a local official who just puts down what they damn please, particularly if it's on a Friday. So, you know, he was saying, be very cautious about the numbers. You need to know where the numbers come from. And if the humor, if the human, sorry, is, um, you know, manipulating the numbers. Um, the experts see what they want to see. And um, so, this is unfortunately what happened in the UK. So the early models that they were using in the UK, and they were good models, so were supporting the very clear, okay, and undoctored models, okay, from China, okay. So this gave them a great comfort that their models were supporting, or that the Chinese models and what they were seeing in the UK in March were were um, supporting each other. Um, but the problem was the China model had a lot of data, but the UK model was very patchy, obviously, because the pandemic had only really just started there. Um, so, in fact, infections were doubling every three to four days and not, and they thought they were doubling every five to six days. Now, somebody would look at that and say there's no difference between three to four relative to five to six. Well, actually, the difference was death for a lot of people. Um, so the experts seeing what they wanted to see at the time. Um, and the best insights are statistics plus, plus personal insights. And this is the view I like. So I will say to people, are you looking at it from a worm's perspective or from a bird's perspective? So the worm's eye view and the bird's eye view are both relevant views of, you know, um, a topic or subject or a, a study. Um, but you want to have both views. So ideally we want the rich detail of personal experience and the broader low resolution view that comes from, um, oh, sorry, I've repeated that twice, that comes from a spreadsheet, okay? Um, we used to have a joke in one of the companies I was working in before we used to say, well, my spreadsheet is bigger than your spreadsheet, you know? So it's kind of, you know, you can have as many spreadsheets as you want, um, you know, with data on it, but it's the personal insight that sometimes makes the difference. Um, everything can become polarized, and we can see that obviously in the American elections now, um, where something that shouldn't be uh, associated with political identity, mask wearing, for example, is now um, associated with a political identity. When, and then you can see uh, Fauci, then, you know, his trust amongst um, Republicans versus. Democrats. So polarization is something that we, we live with every day. Um, critical thinking and statistical analysis. So technical oversight is required. So when you're doing critical thinking and st uh, in with statistics, you do need to have technical oversight. So for example, if you're looking at correlation, so I suppose the obvious thing to look at in relation to correlation is with COVID-19, um, the more testing you're doing, um, the more positive cases you're going to find. So there is a correlation there, but you can't just say to somebody, oh, it correlates. You know, you need to know from a statistical perspective, if, it, if there is a correlation there, which there would appear to be, um, what is the correlation coefficient? What is the coefficient of determination? What's the significance of any regression? You know, the ANOVA for regression, the analysis of, ANOVA stands for analysis of variation, and then uh, simple versus multiple regression. If you're using statistics to infer something from, they call it statistical inference, and actually critical, critical thinking, in a way, if you think about it, is using inference, isn't it? And inference is a statistical uh, skill. You know, so statistical inference is a skill 
um, and critical thinking uses inference, so they are linked. So consideration needs to be given to what the null and alternative hypothesis is, what the test statistic is, what the reference distribution is, what the significance level is, what the confidence interval is, and what the population size is. So um, it's really, really important. You know, confidence intervals, um, Generally, in in engineering, you 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 would not do st statistical studies unless you had a, a greater than 0.95 or 95 percent confidence interval. And yet, in the newspapers, when they're doing statistical studies, the confidence interval is typically at best 0.9, and in some cases, 0.85. I have a problem with that from a statistical perspective. So I'm just giving you that perspective. So um, in relation to philosophers and chronology, you can see that what's interesting here is that, uh, and there's many, many more philosophers. I just got this book there recently. It's a fascinating book, um, Philosophy, a Guide Through the Subject. It's actually only when you pick up Grayling's book, <coughs> it's a great, a great writer, British writer. When you pick up his book, you realize how many philosophers there have been, you know, in both, you know, great countries like China and Japan and India uh, and America and Britain and France and Germany and so on and, and actually lots of Africa even, um, many, many countries, Egypt, um, and he lists them out. Um, but you can see what's interesting here is that the these four, the first four here were all around the same time. Now, Socrates, Plato and Aristotle kind of, some of them, you know, they were pretty much overlapping because um, Plato was a pupil, sorry, Plato was a, a pupil of Socrates um, and also a teacher of Aristotle. Uh, Confucius obviously was in China, but he was alive at the same time. Um, but obviously they wouldn't have known each other. Um, and then you have then um, the, you know, all of the other philosophers and I've only listed three there. I mean, there's, there's, there's 103. Um, Bertrand Russell and, and uh, Gerald Moore would be the more recent ones. So maybe now we can, um, I'm just checking, when I look at my phone here, I'm just checking the time. Um, critical thinking and problem solving. So the importance of critical thinking and to problem solving or to enable good problem solving technique. So it's worth bearing in mind, complex and integrated problems don't necessarily have one solution or even solutions that are easily surfaced. Um, many times the root cause will remain hidden. Um, I always say to people, don't beat yourself up on the root cause or root cause analysis. You know, you may or may not get the root cause. Personally, when I'm problem solving, I'm not that bothered whether I get the root cause or not. I've learned the hard way. I'm more uh, energized about what solutions I'm putting in place for the different models we have validated. Um, beware those who promise a solution or root cause to these types of problems. So questions you should ask when you're set, setting out on a problem solving initiative or exercise. In whose interest is it that the problem be solved? So you're, you know, you're working within a company. So when I say in whose interest, I don't mean the company. Obviously, it's in the interests of the company that the problem is solved, or the client, or the customer. But who within the company or within the customer or client base is it is um, is affected the most by the problem? Sometimes that's a really important question. Who benefits and who is harmed by the solutions that you may propose or that you may implement? What are the unintended consequences of the solutions being implemented? So every time you implement a solution for a complex problem, particularly in a, in a factory, for example, you will, have con you will have unintended consequences. You need to know what they are before you implement the solution. You need to understand what are the alternative solutions. Um, you need to also understand who initially framed this as a problem. You know, was it an individual? Was it a group? Was it the factory manager, you know, was it the CEO? Who was it? Um, is this the right problem to focus on now? Is the problem statement deep and accurate from a technical perspective? So I would never work on a problem if the problem statement that I was being told to work on wasn't deep and technically accurate. So the first thing I do when I'm working, you know, whether it's in a team or as an individual on a problem, I would spend quite some time getting a deep and technically accurate problem statement that might take me an hour 
it might take me a week. Okay. But unless I have that problem statement, I don't do Anthem. What evidence exists to say this is the most pressing problem to be solved? So remember when you're when you're doing problem solving, typically you're applying critical thinking to an analytical thinking technique. Um, so uh, Albert Einstein said, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant. And from his perspective, um, we have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Now, for I suppose for this morning's discussion, and I know you're not, you're listening to me, which is probably quite painful. Um, we're just looking at analytical thinking and critical thinking applied to analytical thinking. Um, for the full day um, discussion, we will also look at inventive thinking or TRIZ, which is the theory of inventive problem solving. It's a Russian technique, um, which is widely used in, obviously in Russia, but it's widely used in other countries as well. So analytical thinking and its use in analytical problem solving. So remember we said problem definition is the root cause, sorry, excuse me, problem definition to the root cause uh, using a structured analytical framework. So here when we're doing analytical problem solving or analytical thinking, which is, you know, helping us solve a problem analytically, um, what we're doing is where information is generated and analyzed until the key elements of a model are in place. Existing or new data is compared to the model for validation purposes. It's based on logic with data being used to support valid and invalid models. It's uh, systematic and the framework is king. And we're gonna talk about the framework here in a minute. And we shouldn't deviate from the framework. So if you're doing problem solving or, um, a problem solving effort is underway, you know, for a big problem in a company, in a factory, in a business, you need to align first on what framework you're going to use. Um, now, no one framework is better than another. The, these are the ones I've used in the past. Um, I tend to use just three, but I, I'll just go through them. Um, there's the, the lean framework, DMAIC, right, which, which is define, measure, analyze, improve, control. There's a variation on that, um, which actually the HSE use um, quite widely. It's called DMADVI. So define, measure, analyze, uh, design, and verify. There's SPS, which get, gets taught in universities, structured problem solving. There's IEI, which is a bit unusual. It's called examine, um, examine improve, execute. There's A3 which is widely used, I might come back to that, A3 thinking. It comes from um, Edward Deming um, and Walter Stewart, who were American government, who sorry, who were sponsored by the American government to work in Japan and who spent some time in Toyota in, 19, in the 1950s. There's PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Adjust. RCA root cause analysis. RCA plus is root causal analysis. It's not the same. MBPS model based problem solving, which is Israeli Air Force, um, and it's my, one of my favorites. Um, seven step problem solving, and then Lambda, which is uh, look, ask, model, discuss, act. So look, ask, model, discuss, act. And there are other frameworks. I would suggest probably um, in this country, in Ireland or the UK for that matter, this one is widely used. DMAIC, um, A3, PDCA, PDSA are widely used. Those, probably those four. And what you need to do is you need to learn, uh, you know, one or two or three of the frameworks. And then you need to learn how to apply them. So within each framework, there's tools, right? So for example, in the, in the if you look at say the first one here, the, the DMAIC, right? So in the DMAIC framework for the define phase, there's a list of tools that you can use to help you define the problem, right? In the measure phase, there's a list of tools that would help you um, measure. So for example, in the define phase, so how, what would the tools, what tools would you use in the define phase? You might use um, what you know, what you don't know. Um, Kepner Trago, um, it would be another tool. Um, direct observation would be another tool. 
Um, uh, let me think. So we've direct observation, what you know, what you don't know. Kevner, Trago, Bazador analysis is another tool for define, right? Um, SIPOC might be one, right? Supplier input process, output customer. So there are tools that you can use to help you get a good problem definition, do you follow, in the define phase. And that's all you're doing when you're when you're using a structured framework. You're, you're saying, you're picking your framework, you're saying, okay, this is the framework we're going to use as a team. And then you then pick the tools you're going to use for each step in the framework. Is that fair enough? And then when employing any one of the frameworks, um, you're using, or you need to use, or you will be using critical thinking to map the two landscapes. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this in the full day. I'm gonna to talk to you about tools versus deliverables, right? So, and I'll probably use Demeg as the example, because it seems to be the one that people can connect with the best. So we look at the Demeg framework, then we look at the tools, and then separately we look at what needs to be delivered for each step of the process. So we're being very analytical, but at the same time, we're using our critical thinking to match the, sorry, to map, excuse me, to map the landscapes. Um, again, critical thinking is no substitute for common sense. Um, as good critical thinking employs great common sense, right? So um, there's no substitute. Your parents will often tell you this when you were growing up, you know, common sense, they call it quasi rationality is, is the technical term for it. But basically common sense is constantly driving you left or right, and it tends to drive you in the right direction. Um, like if we didn't have common sense, we'd all be killed tomorrow, do you follow? So our common sense will save your life every time. So <clears throat> intuitive thinking or judgment over here. So when you need to use more of that, your common sense will drive you over there. And then when you need to reflect on what you've just learned or what you've just seen or what's just happened, your common sense will tend to drive you across here. And your common sense is um, very highly developed um, in, in all humans, even at a very young, young age, believe it or not, that you know, it'll move you over and back here. Um, there are some critical thinking frameworks. Um, I'm just just conscious of time. I'm going to come back to this if we have time. I want to I want to jump ahead here. So we, we look at these frameworks here um, possibly another time. Um, I just want to skip through them here for a minute. So um, people often ask me, well, okay, so we've done all this critical thinking lecture stuff and I'm completely confused. I, was, I wasn't confused when you started, Paul, but now I'm completely confused. And do you know what? You're probably, I don't blame you. But this will help with the confusion. So Christopher, our famous Irish uh, critical thinker, guru, I've, I've modified his map, I mean, but it's pr it predominantly, if you, if you get his book, um, I have you know his most recent book, it's almost identical to this. I've just changed one or two things around. It just made it easier for me to explain it, to be quite honest with you, I haven't changed his intent. Um, but this is what's happening in our lives, right? So if you look at the bottom left, um, so this is all around, oh, actually that's another thing we'll do on the full day. We'll talk about mental modeling and how the long-term and short, long-term, excuse me, and working memory connect with each other. But what, what Christopher is saying here is that um, our, our perception and attention, you know, is typically visual and auditory, right? Now he has left out another channel, which I will include, um, at a later stage so you know your your attention and perception is both visual it's auditory so this morning you're listening to me for example um and you're looking at the di the diagrams that are presented so um but actually good engineers and good technicians will also have a third sense which is um kinesthetic right so they will be feeling or touching um you know through through directly either directly with their hands or through their tools and um, so and that's a really really important sense as well so um all of this uh, attention processing for want of a word a better word is done in a thing here and damn it i've left the label off that's my mistake this should this should say see this blue box here i i took the label off by mistake that should say um short-term uh, excuse me, not short-term memory, that's 
absolutely not. Working memory is what it's called. This is your working memory, okay? So your working memory has about five chunks in it. So this morning, four of your five chunks are full with other stuff and your fifth chunk has been freed up, hopefully temporarily to listen to me, right? So your working memory is this part here. Um, and then your long-term memory, which is infinite, um, is where you build the mental models. Um, and we might talk about that another time. But um, what's happening is, you know, your, your attention is, uh, you're building uh, here in your episodic buffer connecting to your long-term memory okay and you're building models of what i'm what, what i'm talking about with you now now for us to be good critical thinkers we have to have what they call a natural disposition towards um metacognition or thinking twice so provided we have that then what's happening then is this information is going in here and now we're doing um we're doing uh whoops shouldn't have happened now we're uh using reflected judgment um and we're doing analysis evaluation and inference okay and based on what's happening here okay we're then potentially going to do some critical thinking on what we've learned right so we're you know potentially developing arguments doing some verbal reasoning you know doing some problem solving judging likelihood and uncertainty so I suppose what I what what this map is showing is is that it doesn't just happen, you know. For all of, for this cycle to happen, even once, could take a couple of days. So, for example, if you look at reflection, re reflective judgment, so it's not possible to reflect on anything I've said now because I'm just overloading you with information. It's probably not going to be possible to reflect on any of it until at the very earliest this evening and possibly not even till the weekend. So depending on how busy your life is or how how overloaded we are cognitively, um, we have to take, we have to make time for us to do this reflection, do you follow? Because it's only when we're doing that reflection, do we build the mental model in our long-term memory? And it's only when we start to build the mental model in our long-term memory that we begin to comprehend or understand, if that makes sense. And then at a later stage, you know, as we begin to build our comprehension, then we can start doing our, um, you know, developing arguments. You know, we don't have to do hypothesis testing, but you know, we can do our problem solving. We can judge likelihood and uncertainty based on, you know, what we've learned. Um, I just wanted to show you that. And then um, maybe we'll just finish up with, with this. So um, the whole thing around the East, Eastern, uh, sorry, the Western versus Eastern thinking uh, process, you know, Aristotle and Confucius uh, specifically, and um, this is a great book. This is one of my favorite books of all time, this book here. Um, pragmatic strategy, it's not, a, it's not about strategy at all. These guys always put these titles on just so they can sell the books. Um, Nonaka is a, a brilliant man, he's still alive. Um, I've read pretty much everything he's written, I think at this stage. Um, he's Japanese. <clears throat> this guy here is Chinese. So this is the first um, book I've read by him, but it's a really good book. Um, so um, in the West or in Western thinking, um, we, they call it Aristotelian thinking, right? So we're brought up by our parents and the way we're taught in school to, to, to look at uh, thinking vertically. Do you follow? And um, so if you look at our from Aristotle's perspective, episteme means scientific, scientific thinking, right? So it's ironic that um, uh, Aristotle actually put science at the lower level of thinking. And then he put technique, which is the craft thinking. So in other words, he, he would have, uh, or not just him, but in the those times people who could use their hands you know whether they were marble masons or carpenters or whatever were considered you know from a hierarchical perspective way above the scientists and the philosophers and then the practical knowledge was the highest level of knowledge so to be able to i suppose blend the science and the craft into what they called uh, practical knowledge or pronesis was considered the highest intellectual um, virtue 
Um, and then morals, which were important, right? Um, but they were considered separately, um, not as part of this. Uh, whereas in the Confucian uh, uh, thinking, um, Confucius, he called it uh, woolly, shilly, renly, right? So woolly was acting efficiently, shilly was acting creatively, and then renly was acting ethically. Um, and uh, Confucius said that, you know, you don't go around like this. You basically do whichever one makes sense at the time. So he called it um, this timely balancing or Shishong uh, was really, really important. And he said, the, <laughs> Confucius said the ability to use this timely balance was how, how you actually gained wisdom. And you'll often see this when you're dealing, you know, and working in China and stuff like that. You'll see the Chinese will do this almost without thinking. They'll go over and back. It be quite can be quite frustrating for Westerners because we're kind of this way. Um, but they're 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 doing this because this is the way they've been brought up from a thinking perspective, circular thinking. So I think um I think we're on 45 minutes there, um, Elva. So 